Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran who has polished all of the veneer off of your Recording Academy gramophone statuette, or else a scrappy upstart who has a notebook filled with different attempts at an iconic autograph, this is your show. Because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey everybody, it's the first Friday of 2022 and I thank you for joining us. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I'm old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made and it would always be some guy named Dietrich who drove a Mazda Elantra with a 7 Mary 3 bumper sticker, and who was always trying to sell you Excedrin tablets that he claimed were designer drugs. And old Dietrich would charge you about a 1000 bucks for a website that would be obsolete in six months. But it's the future now, you guys. That's not how it works anymore. We're allowed to have nice things now. One of those nice things is Banzoogle. Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in. Hosting in a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, tools to sell your music and merch commission-free. Listeners to the Working Songwriter podcast can go to bandzoogle.com and try it for free for 30 days. Use the promo code TWS to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. If you'd like to hear some of my music live in the coming weeks, the first Sunday of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern, I'm over on my YouTube channel for Sunday Songs. That's a live stream. I'm live. I'm playing tunes. I'm taking questions in the live chat. I'm taking requests in the live chat. It's a very fun, very interactive experience. I dare to say that we're building something of a community over there on Sunday nights, including many people who are listeners to this podcast. So come on over and be a part of it the first Sunday of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern over on YouTube. Head on over to YouTube and search for Joe Pug or go to JoePugMusic.com and click on the live stream tab. Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, here's a couple things that you could do to help. First, you could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Patreon is a platform that allows you to directly support creative endeavors that you find meaningful. You just head to their site, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, you search for The Working Songwriter or you search for my name, and then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month for the show. Think of it as a voluntary subscription, a subscription that you certainly don't have to kick in for, but that you you just choose to because you dig the show and you won't miss a few bucks at the end of the month. If just 1% of our listenership would kick in the price of a cup of coffee every month, it would make an immense difference. So thank you to everybody who's taken the time and means to do that. I really appreciate you. Uh, and if you're not in a place where you can contribute that way, I understand you can still help the the show in a couple ways that are entirely free. First, you could leave us a rating in the iTunes store, or second, you could simply tell a friend about the show, spread the word about the show. The simple math on those two things is that they will help me much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. Okay, I'll end all the harassment there. Only thing to uh, note about the show today, the very start of the show, very start of the interview, uh, there's a, a phone ringing just for a little while in the background um, of the interview. I promise you, it doesn't go on for very long. Uh, don't turn off the podcast uh, just because of that, uh, when that starts ringing, because I promise we take care of it and the rest of the interview sounds good. And you're not going to want to miss all these pearls of wisdom from Miss Eliza Gilkison.
Our guest this week is an American folk music icon who has been recording music and touring for going on five decades now. Eliza Gilkison grew up in Los Angeles where show business was the family trade. Her father, Terry Gilkison, was an in-house songwriter for Walt Disney Films who would be nominated for an Academy Award for his song, The Bear Necessities, in the 1967 animated classic, Jungle Book. Eliza was bit by the bug herself and released her first self-titled album in 1969. After taking a hiatus to raise a family, she moved to Austin, Texas in 1981 and plugged herself into the thriving independent music scene back when Austin was still weird. She's been nominated for two Grammy Awards. She is a member of the Texas Music Hall of Fame and the Austin Songwriter Hall of Fame, and she's won a ton of Austin Music Awards and Folk Alliance Music Awards. Her songs have been covered by Joan Baez, Bob Geldof, and Roseanne Cash. For the last 20 years, she has recorded for the folk music label Red House Records. Pop Matters described her latest effort as masterfully written and performed folk that spans 40 years. And No Depression put her in rarefied air when it said that she stands along Pete Seeger, Joan Baez, and Woody Guthrie in steering us through the moral complacency of a too often callous society. A few weeks ago, I got a chance to talk on the phone with Miss Gilkison to hear about her epic journey so far. Often I begin these interviews uh, asking artists how they first got introduced to music and songwriting, but from what I can tell, there seems to be a very easily discernible answer for you, because your father was a professional songwriter. What do you remember about music around your household growing up, and how keyed into you uh, to what your father's profession was uh, were you as a kid? I mean, I, I was... I was hooked really early on. I, I mean, I, I've talked about this before, but I, one of my earliest memories was, I think I was about four years old and my dad was, we were up in Wyoming at this ranch we used to go to and my dad would perform there at night sometimes for the guests. And uh, so I remember that we were, there was a big fire in an old log cabin and all these people just listening to my dad and I crept across the, the floor to where my dad was sitting and I stood up and looked out as like I was standing right next to him and looked out at everybody and I it's like one of my earliest memories I remember very well how this this energy that was happening it was so intoxicating it's it it really hit me even then at age four that this was something really special and and I and I wanted in, <laughs> so that was early. And then you know, there's sort of the good, bad, the bad and the ugly because our dad would, you know, he was sitting at the dining room table. He would force us to sing harmonies and sing little. Um, sorry, that's that's Angie calling, going, "What's happening?" <laughs> um, so. Uh, so I, he would force us to sing these little ditties and then sing harmonies and do rounds and all these things. But, and we were, you know, you're a kid, you're annoyed with your dad. <laughs> so, right. but at the same time, I learned harmonies. I damn well learned the harmonies. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, and then he had me singing very early on his, because um, I had a kind of a mature voice that came really early. And so he would have me do his demos because he, he was a lot of times writing songs for other artists. And, uh, so he would have me go in the studio, um, these you know, in these big studios, and sing his songs for his demos. And uh, was that in Los Angeles? Uh huh. Yeah, some of the famous old uh, analog studios there, the um, Gold Star Records, and and even the Disney Studios too. I because he wrote for Disney, and and he, they would take me over to Disney Studios to do his demos for the movies. So uh, yeah, there, and th- that was like a cavernous. It was like a studio that was big as a gymnasium, and the, the the guys were you know the engineers and everybody were up in a little little tiny photo booth way up in the air. It's I, I vaguely recall you know how uh, yeah. Th- th- anyway, I was terrified. So uh, I'm I'm really interested in the Los Angeles uh, of that 
time period. How how aware of you? Uh, how aware were you of like the movie business and and the music business being centered there at that time, or, or did you just uh, did you just kind of go to school and this was something that you did with your dad on the weekends on the side? I was aware because I knew that my dad was living in an alternate world to anything my friends were experiencing. They 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 were living it, you know, very uh, conventional structures and we were not and so people came in and out of our house that it was just um unusual and my my dad had ba- you know s- several bands and they had young guys in his bands that were just like you know like one of his second bands had van dyke parks in it a young 16 year old van dyke parks was in my dad's band he, he moved to uh la when he was 16 years old hollywood and uh so, I mean, those are the kind of people that were around and Van Dyke was just like such an exotic, interesting person and all their friends, they were so cool. So I was really aware very early on that this was the life I wanted. I loved music. I was really proud of my dad. I mean, he, he was a real, very venerable to young folk singers and um, some of the folk singers that I idolized. Everybody knew who my dad was. So it was, it was exciting. So when did you kind of make the jump from, hey, I'm a kid that's kind of into music and I, I like what my old man does here, but this is going to be my career. I'm going to go forward with it. How did that, how and when did that happen? I think it was a pretty natural evolution because I just, I wanted that life and I was kind of an angst ridden teenager, so a uh, young teenager. So I, I think I wanted to express myself, you know, and, uh, and, and, uh, I picked up the guitar pretty early, and I just wanted to um, get in, get involved as quickly as I could. I s- started playing with other other mutual friends, and um, I, I knew very early on that I wanted to have a life in music. So, um, and my dad was very helpful to a point. And then, you know, when the '60s thing happened, that was the end of his his reign. You know, that stuff was happening that he that it just wasn't his world anymore. So at that point, um, our, our roads really parted, you know, amicably. It was just not his thing. It was not his scene. So um, That's really interesting. How did he feel about that? I think he got it. He understood how amazing it was. But I think there was a surrender involved as well, where he was realizing that what he did was passe. And, yeah. uh, um, and there was nothing. He, he, he wasn't going to be one of those older guys, older musicians that try to act, you know, those guys that cut oh, their know. hair and, you know, <laughs> they, they, and they try to be hip and they were yeah. awful. And, and he never, he, he would never be that. So um, he had to kind of go quietly into that good night. And, uh, and he, I thought he accepted it. Uh, he, he'd made some a- attempts, but uh, I think he felt like uh, his race, he had run his race, and I, I think he felt good about retiring at that point. He had written The Bare Necessities by then, so <laughs> it wasn't like yeah. he needed the money. And yeah. um, so I think he, he uh, retired to New Mexico, and he did occasional little things. He did, he did some wonderful performances, but he wasn't part of the scene anymore. What a gift that is for you, though, uh, as you're kind of coming of age and starting your own career with your own voice, because no one wants to do the same exact thing that their parents did. You know what I mean? So with this kind of new zeitgeist coming through, it, it was kind of a perfect opportunity for you to to take a different road. I did. And and, and although he didn't understand it, he um, he he was very supportive. I don't I didn't get, you know, negative like that that's garbage you know he got it it was musical stuff that was happening but he also realized that he wasn't going to have a say in it anymore <laughs> as far as i sure. was concerned yeah i was i was gone into it at that point myself so you made your first record super early i, I don't even think you were 20 when it was released yeah. um how did that first album um <laughs> come about and, and what do you remember the most about the making of it well that was it was a friend of my dad's who um who got me the deal with RCA and uh, and produced and then went on to produce the record, and, and um, it was really fun. It was the first time I got to just get in there and do my thing. And my brother Tony was in the band and some my and my other two band members. And um, you, you know, I listen back to it now, and I, <laughs> it's, it's you know it's 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 pretty pretty youthful, <laughs> pretty pretty amateur really. But it mm-hmm. had a 60s vibe to it, for sure. Yes. 
And, and how was that? How was it made? Like, is that the old school? I mean, I hear, you know, you get signed to RCA and there's someone producing it for you. I hear like an A&R man, you know, out of the movie saying like, listen here, girl, this is how yeah. it's going to be. You know, <laughs> like, like, like how was it though, really? It was like doll, you know, doll. You know, there was yeah. there was that, that old industry speak, you know, it was a Hollywood speak. But this, but the guy that produced it actually was a very dear man. And he really did let us probably to you know probably would have been a good idea for him to have been more you know hands-on because yeah. we just took the thing and ran and we didn't know what we were doing so when i listen back to it now i i see we were rather self-indulgent but there was a there was a, some vibe on there for sure but he tommy what was his name uh tommy mack he was a uh, an a r guy and producer and uh, a really very dear guy. And he was kind of big at, at the time. He had, he had his staple of acts. Actually, I should do some research on Tommy and find out who he yeah. produced in those days. Note to self. <laughs> what did you learn the most from doing that first record and getting your first shot? Um, that, that I was going to need to do it again and again. I was just going to have to keep doing it. And, and that's actually a really good thing to know. One of the things that I was never taught was that ev that success is built on a, on a series of failures, you know. So um, it, I had expectations that, you know, all these things were going to happen. And, and then my record got dropped. <laughs> I got dropped from RCA before it even came out because they, they had a new A&R guy who wanted to bring in all his artists. So uh, I, the record never even came out. So I think you know, there was a kind of a, you know, sort of disappointment around that. But mostly, I think, over time, you know, it was like, you just have to keep making mistakes to get better. There, there's, there's no shortcut. How, how do you think at such a young age, though, you had that um, perspective? I, I mean, so many people at that age will get negative feedback from the world and decide that it's the world's fault and not theirs, whereas you were kind of looking at it in a different, more constructive way, in my opinion, of saying, well, maybe there's some things that I could do a lot better so that my, my art would be more undeniable uh, to, me, to people. How, how do you, why did you approach it that way rather than the former? I was just burning up. I was just burning up with music. I mean, I was so in love with music. There was no, and, and you know, the fact is, there was nothing else I wanted to do, even at an early age. There was no, no, nothing ever called to me. You know, there was nothing I was very good at, particularly either. And and the whole thing was so intoxicating to me. It, it and I think I was also a very invisible kid. I was very shy, little girl, and a middle child. I was very um, unsure of myself. I. Um, I was just a, like a little shadow and and music was this opportunity for me to invent myself and and I went for it. I really did. I saw there was power in it and and I I wanted that. I mean, I don't think I consciously said there's power in it. I was just gravitated towards it very viscerally. I I don't think I had a you know, conscious uh, thought about it as much as it was just the pull was undeniable. So there's about a 10 year period, about a decade between that first record and when your career, as we all know you now, really starts in earnest. I, I think you then turned up in, in Austin, Texas. Talk to me about what happened in that decade between those two records and how you, how you ended up at a place where you began the career that we all know you for. I, I, that was one of the most mistaken driven periods of my life. <laughs> I was married to my manager. Really good idea. <laughs> yeah, you can talk about note to self. Do yeah. the thing. No, don't do. And especially for women, you know. I mean, it's at that time, um, it's so easy to kind of think a man was going to save you. That it was really the mentality, you know. So, I I was and I was seduced, and and I have to say, I went ahead and and went along with it absolutely, by sort of a pop. You know, like I, we got in with a production company in Austin that was very uh, pop oriented and they, and I had the choice, do you want to go country or do you want to go pop? And both didn't seem to fit who I was, but I tried on that pop thing and I, you know, got a mullet and put my acoustic guitar under the bed for years 
and try, and got all these synthesizer things and tried all that and I, you know I listen back to it now and it's it's embarrassing you know I I it was like I just got farther and farther away colder and colder for, you know it's like you're getting colder <laughs> but I I just had to I guess I had to live it out or something but that was a long period of of, of life and it it wasn't till um, in the it was really the in the nineties that I started to um, pull the guitar out again and just go, you know, what is, what, who am I, you know, and um, I, I had to strip everything down and take the synthesizers out and just pull in acoustic instruments and focus on my voice and what I, and, you know, the tone and just um, try to let my voice, find out how my voice was linked to the real me. <laughs> so I spent years, um, you know, in the late 90s, mid to late 90s really trying to figure out uh, figure that out and that and then you know things really shifted after that was there a breaking point for you uh, or was there a moment sort of a lucid moment where you can remember thinking of that you know what you call a sort of a, a series of mistakes mm -hmm. was there a lucid moment there where you said you know what this definitely isn't working and i got to try something new yeah there was there were several moments like that uh, where i uh, i realized um also that I needed to get myself out there because I was always waiting around for some record deal or something to happen so that would put money into me instead. Of, and then I had all these friends like Nancy Griffith, Lucinda, they were all just road dogging it. And I didn't road dog. I had two kids and they did, you know, a lot of yeah. my friends did not have kids. They went out on the road and really made stuff happen. But I had two kids and, uh, and I was the single parent. So, um, I, I just had to figure out a way to do it without touring. And, you know, touring was how that, you, know, you look at Lucinda, I mean, and, and Chapin and all, uh, my friends, Sean, all of them, they, they um, went out and, and played all those funky clubs for years. And, and they, that's how they made it happen. And I didn't do that. So I was 50 and I realized, um, if I don't get my butt out on the road and just take, you know, just take it on the chin, I'm going to have regrets. And that was mm. the, the epiphany really was I don't want to be 70 and look back and say, why didn't I try? You know, so um, yeah, that was really I, and I I got an agent and she said, you're going to have to play for fifty dollars opening for people to just get mm. into some of these rooms. And I said, uh, book me i'll do it i'll do it wow. I, I opened for people who you know very very you know untalented accent in rooms yeah. and uh i i did i did humiliating you know gigs at age 50 and yeah uh, I, and i just went i sucked it up because i had a, a goal and I, I could see that it was getting better and better and better for me each show, it was better, and then more things led to more things. So it, I had to start with the grassroots. I had to start at zero. Oh man, that takes a lot of uh, fortitude because, I mean, at the very start when you you know, start club touring, you, you do have to take it on the chin pretty much all the time. But I, you know, that just feels different. I would imagine at twenty two than it does as fi at fifty. Yeah, um, exactly. Like you're you're talking about. Can you remember any? Uh, like uh, any, like what was the darkest moment that you remember from that period of just like you're at a club and you're just like, what the, what the hell am I doing here? Well, I had a number of them, but I, there was some horrible act that I had to open for in Las Cruces. And, and I think, I mean, we joked about it for years later. We, could, we would say, hey, I opened for, you know, <laughs> yeah. and we would name this person's name and it, it was like, so bad where you know i just wanted to go out to the car and just sit in the car until it was time to go on and and uh, and i remember i i got that was a night i got 50 dollars. but um you know yeah you have to be you have to be grateful you know you, you just cannot fall prey to bitterness or um should no. have could have you know any of that stuff or people can scent that you know it, it's like if you got to love your life and 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 this was you know i by the time i was 50 i figured that out so i was like i gotta make this even this has got to i gotta make this beautiful because this is my life you know 
and uh, I know where I'm going, and so I, I was able to, you know, carry on, but yeah, there were some, it, it was humiliating. The humiliation is sort of like when, you know, you see all your friends or your peers are all doing these things, and, and you're, uh, you know, they're, you know, trying to get into a club that holds 50 people and get paid $100. There's a sense of humiliation around that, especially when you're older. It's like I, yeah. I am. I have so many miles on my tires, and I, and I'm good at what I do. And that to be here, that is humiliating. And yeah, but it, music business is humiliating, no matter how old you are. It always is. <laughs> I, I, I have friends who are famous who always say, "Yeah, we used to play arenas. Now we're only playing theaters." You know, it's like right. Yeah. So it's all you're always comparing, you know, and um, and you just can't fall prey to it. I, I love that idea, though, that you mentioned that, you know, the idea of you have to make your life beautiful. And it, it's not just about, you know, taking it on the chin and being bitter on the inside and just not saying it outwardly because people can people do smell that. And, and it, it's still corrosive to your soul. But yeah. the idea that you have to objectively make your life um, beautiful, like a, a thing of beauty that you want to look at every day, that you want to participate in every day. Um, I, I just think that that's a wonderful paradigm to work under. Well, it's so well said. And I think it's something that com comes hard earned, you know, with, with some knocks. I, um, but it's essential. And I, I teach songwriting, and that's one of the things I, I tell them, you know, have a beautiful, a meaningful life. With, you know, that that's what makes for good, good songs yeah. you know have it have it meaningful and deep and profound and and make it beautiful and uh, and, and these are the worst of times you know so um, it's a it's a challenge to to make it beautiful but I, I think it's an essential challenge because otherwise what is your your option is to shut down and yes uh, that's Everything, everything is enticing us to shut down right now. But it would be a really good idea if we didn't, because that you know you shut down, then you stop caring, and if you stop caring, then you know we're lost. So I, you know, <laughs> my philosophy in a nutshell there. <laughs> <laughs> Are you stuck in a rut? Are you tired of listening to that Jimmy Buffett 20th Century Masters CD over and over again and need some new music? Are you sick of making hamburger helper beef stroganoff for dinner every night and you want something new to cook? What you are looking for, my friends, is the Enthusiast Digest. That's my monthly newsletter, which arrives in your inbox the first Sunday morning of every month, bursting with musical recommendations, poetry selections, recipes and cooking techniques for my favorite dishes, and items of general interest culled from the vast cesspool that is the Internet. The Enthusiast Digest is free to subscribe to. If you dig the poetry that you hear on this show and the artists that you're hearing from, you'll dig the newsletter because I approach it with the exact same sensibility of curation. Go to joepugmusic.com slash newsletter today to sign up for free. That is joepugmusic.com slash newsletter. It takes approximately 15 seconds to sign up for a free newsletter that will enrich the first Sunday of your month with a veritable cornucopia of new and delightful recommendations. That's the Enthusiast Digest, the first Sunday of every month. Sign up for free at joepugmusic.com slash newsletter. One of the most interesting parts of Eliza's career is the decade during which she disappeared between her first album and returning back on the scene in 1981. She took time to raise a family, to live life. That can be frightening to do as an artist. Sometimes it feels like the creative muse is some pagan god that continually demands sacrifice and will slip away in the middle of the night forever if you don't show up every day or every month or every year 
with the proper offering. But Eliza turns that notion on its head. The muse, inspiration, beauty itself, they are latent within our creative selves. And they don't turn tail and run like some spurned lover just because you have to spend a decade bandaging skinned knees and making peanut butter sandwiches. To think otherwise is to delude yourself with Bronze Age superstition. And there's a wonderful poem by my favorite poet, Steve Scafidi, that speaks to that ability of the commonplace parts of life to actually inspire us. It's entitled, Lines for a Doorway. The Shenandoah disappears where it converges in the flow of the Potomac 10 miles from here. And nothing Shakespeare ever said sticks in my ear like, hello, my love, when I get home. So pity the beauty of art, and pity the monument to grace a river is as it goes slowly without forethought to the green grave of the sea. And pity the moon dented by the white boots of astronauts and look, look at the sun rolling overhead like a wheel. And wherever we go after death is okay with me as long as death comes too eventually and the sentimental X's crossed over the eyes of everyone who has already lived imply an alphabet that spells nothing but sorrow. Which is exactly why when I get home ruined from work and the moon disintegrates from the light friction of its voyage in the cold dark of space, she says, hello there my love and touches my face. You've been teaching songwriting for years. How has your own songwriting changed the most uh, from when you began to to now in your daily or weekly practice? Well, I'm I'm really unfortunately one of those you know undisciplined writers. Um, I I do have to kind of I've always had to be by myself and not have anything around me, and I have to really um, you know shut down the media now and, and, and really that's huge internalized, but I've always been driven by a sense of, of longing and I've actually kind of studied that. Um, and I talk about it in my classes because, um, I think as we get older, when we're younger, we're just filled with longing, you know, for, uh, we long, long for our future, you know, we long for a whole life that's, um, mm -hmm. beckoning to us. But when you're older, you're a little more placated and, so how do you tap into that longing again? And so there's a real art to that. And it, it, it involves sh you know, shutting down the externals and sitting with a sense of real discomfort. So um, that's what I've had, had. I still discipline myself that way. But usually I wait till, excuse me, till I have to wait. write a record. Hey, we wait no. a minute. I'm going to give my dogs a treat. They're getting antsy. Yeah, Hang yeah, yeah. Second. You're fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So uh, um, I don't know that my songwriting has actually changed that much. Um, uh, well, I want to ask you about one of the points you just made there, though. Why does that involve, why does um, keeping that longing, as you put it, why does keeping that longing fresh and relevant, why does that involve discomfort and sitting with discomfort, in, in your opinion? Maybe it's because we spend so much time during the day placating ourselves that when, when something comes up, we go eat something or we go watch something or plug into mm -hmm. something else. And that it sort of is a buildup maybe of little denials here and a little door shut all over the place. And then when you sit with yourself without placating um, those, you're, there's a little kind of veil of discomfort you've got to kind of chew through. But I, I, you just you you get antsy. You want to get up. You want to do something, and and I have found that 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 discomfort is often uh, uh, the predecessor to creativity. So you got to sit with it. You just got to get you know keep hanging with it, and eventually you just go, damn it! You want to pick up the guitar. You want to do something. You want to. You you just got to express yourself. And um, so I that often is how I get things going, especially 
uh, now that I'm not an angst-driven teenager anymore, and so I don't have these, you know, these emotional ups and downs the, the way I used to. But the creative, um, the creative well is still there. I mean, it's it's just that I, you know, I have to make sure I shut everything down enough to to, to inspire it to come to the surface. There are so many competing voices for that sort of attention that you're talking about, even compared to, I would say, five years ago, six years ago, certainly compared to, let's say, 10 years ago when the iPhone became ubiquitous. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it's uh, sometimes I wonder um, if our brains were even made to uh, contend with this amount of information. I think in earlier ages, not to give ourselves too much credit here, but I think in earlier ages when there was less available media, even when there was just less available, you know, uh, food, television, less available stimulus, mm -hmm. um, maybe it would have been uh, easier is the wrong word. Maybe it would have been more available for people. Maybe people would have been more available for creative work. Does that make sense? What oh, I'm saying? There? I, I totally agree. I mean, I think uh, it's, and our brains are definitely being re reprogrammed to interpret the world through a, a very tiny screen. I mean, I mean, the world is coming to us through a screen instead of in the actual real-time world. That, that's got to be doing some reprogramming there. It does. So I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I worry about kids starting out that way because those of us who are older, we ha we locked on enough to the real world that the virtual world is is a little distraction, but it's not the world. So uh, yes. it's a different wiring for sure. And and I worry about it. I worry about it. You know what you just said there. Even three years ago, I would have completely agreed with that. You know uh, what's on the screen is just you know some digital. Uh, simulation of, of what we're doing, but there's the real world there. That being said, as I run my business doing music, so much of my quote real world is through that phone. I mean, that's how I'm selling merchandise. It's yeah. how I'm selling tickets. It's how I'm responding to people who uh, have been affected by the music. It's, you know, it's how I do everything. So in the last three years, I've kind of reached this place where I'm terrified and I'm like, oh shit, what if this is the real world now? You know? <laughs> yeah. I think that's a really good, you know, place to get to. And so much more happens in the virtual world than happens in your daily life. I mean, <laughs> it's just, I, when I go out there, I kind of walk around, I, you know, look at the plants, I, you know, yeah. watch the sunset. It's pretty simple. And yeah. uh, it's not the same, although I do find it stimulating to be out there. Maybe it's more a question of balancing those, those two things right now, because of we course. certainly do work in a virtual world now, and and uh, that's how our that's our those are our friends and uh, you know yes. our contact with other people and and it's real contact. It's I mean, it's, yes, these you know live streaming a show. I really feel connected. In a, a Zoom meetings. I'm doing Zoom songwriter workshops. We have a blast together, and we bond. And so it's it's not all you know. It's not the evil devil thing, but I do think we should be balancing them because we, we also are living in a time when I, I think it's going to be upon us possibly in, probably in our lifetimes that we're going to have to live with less and we're going to have to be able to follow the trail of breadcrumbs back out of the forest and, and if there is any reason to keep that muscle going it might just be that we got to learn to live with less and that may mean in our work and also in just you know our survival so um, because we are living in an unsustainable situation, and I don't, we don't know how that's going to play out. But it's probably not going kind to. Of, we're not going to get more. We're going to have to live with less. So, I think it's a good exercise, if nothing else. It's it's interesting there because uh, you're kind of making a, a connection between uh, if you're creating something, then then you're a maker. Um, uh, but you're talking about people who are makers also. Uh, Maybe consumption or, or pathological consumption in some way um, can harm your ability to make. Like, are those two opposite? Are those two opposite forces that live in tension with one another? Consumption and creation. Well, I, I mean, I, I can see that in a primitive time, a person like me would have been like, 
you're still going to have to go out and hunt and gather. You know, you're still going to have to right. pound this hide. And if you want to, if you want to, you know, make a charcoal mark on the cave at night after you've done all your shit, right. then fine, you go ahead and do it. It would certainly put art, or you want to bang on this, you know, this right. bone, you know, rattle here. You know, we'll do that on Saturday when you know we take some time off. But right. I definitely don't think that you know 100% of my time just being creative. There, it would be different. You know, it would yes. it would have a different place in the scheme of things. Yes. What do you think? What's the most important quality uh, that a teacher can bring to the table with students? The sense that that everybody has has real gifts, and in in terms of songwriting specifically, I am utterly convinced that everybody can write and that Me too. we oh i'm so glad to hear you say that i i think we all have i mean i have students who can play two chords not great and they write such cool stuff and yes. i i just want people to be to know that about themselves that they are creators and i and it's a selfish thing because as i said earlier i really think that staying sentient is going to be essential um, in survival because we have to care and so it's my job is for is for, to help people realize that they are sentient beings and that they have a create creative side that will perfectly express who they are and the experiences that they've had and that they shouldn't feel compare themselves to other people but i truly believe they've got the, a little thing in there that is worthy and that is worth pursuing. So I think that's where I start. Yeah, that's almost a religious idea, the spark of the divine, made in God's image. You know, that, I'm, I'm, but really, I though, that. I mean... I love that, I love that, right. Um, I mean, but, but it is, and, and, you know, and that's a, that's a faith uh, that, that you carry with you, and it's one that I carry as well. I, I, do, I do see it in everybody. You know, I don't think any, everyone's going to be um, uh, Bob Dylan or Gillian Welch anytime soon, Absolutely. but... Absolutely. Commercial, but, the commercial thing is a different thing. That's a different thing. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, right on. Well, listen, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show. I'm a huge fan of yours. My wife is a huge fan of yours and has been for uh, many years. And uh, just thank you for taking the time to come on the show. I really appreciate it. I have had such a good time talking to you. So I'm sure everyone does. So thank you so much. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Eliza Gilkison's latest album is entitled 2020, available everywhere music is sold or streamed. If before we meet again you sit down to write, please remember... An expensive drug habit is not a song. A compelling Instagram account is not a song. And most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself. And for you, just keep your eye on the song. 